Just got out of bed. Sam's got a monster. Just got out of bed, still have my long underwear on, and threw one cast and hooked into this pretty nice size pipe. You want help landing them or you want to do it? You want me to do it or you want to do it? Um, it's probably easier if I do. If you can keep videoing, I think we should get this. That's a 40 incher, Sam. He's wrapping himself. He's fat. He's a fat dude. dude. He's he's heavy. Hold, hold, here, you hold him. I'll get a. Hey, you got the other gill. Yesterday was a it was a long travel day. We we paddled roughly 12 to 15 miles at five portages, so we were really 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 worn out. We wanted to get some good sleep uh, last night, so we got into our bags about 8 p.m. and then slept till 8 a.m. 12 hours of sleep, and I rolled out of my bed, put my shoes on. I'm in my long underwear and a sweatshirt and a hat, and I just walk down to the lake, grab my fishing rod, and I throw out a cast, just you know, first cast, and I'm reeling it up, and bam. I hook into a pretty nice size northern, and, and I know I could see it in the water. I'm like, this is pretty nice. And I, Brandon's still up in the, in, the, in the tent, so I'm yelling, Brandon, 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 get down here. I have a big northern on. And so he runs out of the tent, still in his, uh, in his socks, starts videotaping, so you'll be able to see the footage. But we end up landing the biggest northern I've ever caught in my life, which is pretty amazing. That The first cast, right out of bed, a beautiful morning, the lake's calm, and uh, God is gracious, and he gave me this, this amazing... Uh, northern that you know I've been I'm 23 years old and I've never caught a northern that big so that's pretty amazing right there that was awesome literally just got out of bed <laughs> okay explain what this what was happening right there. the wilderness is unpredictable which is why we love it doesn't play by our rules, or our expectations, or our timeline. Sam and I paddled for miles yesterday and spent hours trying to catch a few nice pike, only to come up empty. And then return to our campsite to find that they were right under our noses yeah. the entire time. So we grab my rod, drop it down, and sure enough he nails it, and we caught mm -hmm. this pike right here up the campsite. Probably about a seven pounder. <laughs> That's awesome. That's pretty cool. Got off. I'm coming over. That's nice. That's, that, that's the one uh, I had follow up, maybe, before. Oh, maybe. You are terrible right now, man. It's a good fish. You should measure that.
31. On that scale, that's eight and a half pounds. Yeah, see so that's similar size to the one that came up and and you got that out that way. I wonder if we should go out and sit that baby. Oh! 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 That might have been the same one you caught. That's big. Do you have that on? Yeah. <laughs> I hope I got it. Good night. How did I not get that in his mouth? I don't know. He's right there, though. <laughs> How did I not get that in his mouth, Sam? That was crazy. That's a good one. He's a little keeper. Neither of us have eaten a bass roasted over a fire with a stick, which today apparently makes it the thing to do. We decided to pair it with some T-bones that we hauled 20 miles in with us. A little wilderness surf and turf, you could say. And as good as it is, I'm reminded about what really makes this trip special. Sam and I are out here constantly discussing what the Bible has to say about life and masculinity. And this does something to the soul. In the book of Deuteronomy, it says man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. So a man really lives when he's heard the word of God, understood it, and reoriented his life around it. To give you a taste of our ongoing conversations, we captured Sam in action explaining God's design for man out of Genesis 1-3. to May the word of God minister to you as it has to us. They say everything tastes better in the wilderness, which is true. But a T-bone? Oh man. Oh man. Heaven on earth. When Brandon and I are discussing manhood, um, a lot of times we're talking about how we defend biblical manhood. And, and today's arguments, a lot of them revolve around the fact that, uh, oh, that was just cultural. That was just a cultural thing 2,000 years ago. Uh, that's, that doesn't apply to us today. Uh, today we're, we're progressing, we're moving forward, we're, we're changing. We don't have to look at a book that's you know, thousands and thousands of years old to see what it means to be a man and what it means to be a woman. Uh, but in the very beginning of Genesis, we see that God created man and woman in his image. Uh, and that was before sin even entered in the world. That was in the very beginning. It, doesn't have, it has nothing to do with culture. Uh, being masculine and being feminine has everything to do with how God created us, how God designed us. And again, if we are to live according to our design, it promotes human flourishing. So let's actually look at that Genesis passage and, and just pluck a few things out of it, uh, make a few points uh, about being made in the image of God. Again, it's in Genesis 1, uh, 26 through 27. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So again, part of being created and made in the image of God is being male and female. And those are very distinct. You're either male or you're female. And part of uh, being male means that you image God in a unique way that women do not. And part of being female means you image God in a unique way that women do not. So I myself fully image God. Again, we're talking about pre-fall. So before sin comes in and, and really messes everything up, my sin does not image God. But pre-fall, so let's just talk about Adam. Uh, the fullness of Adam imaged God. The fullness of Eve imaged God. Everything about them imaged God. And when you bring them two together, and you could say in one flesh as, as they came together in a marriage, uh, they fully image all that God desired to uh, image in humanity. And if you wanted to be very specific, we, we, we don't know if it's exactly 50-50. It probably is, but, you know, Adam... Uh, imaged 50% of what God desired to image in humanity, and Eve 
uh, imaged 50% of what God desired to image in humanity. So that means that Adam has some very unique roles and a very unique design that Eve does not have. And the same with Eve. Eve has some very unique roles uh, and, and a very unique calling that a man does not have, that Adam did not have. So the, they're equal in that sense, totally equal in dignity and worth and in value before God. Both of them image God, and that's an amazing thing. But they have different roles, and we see this in the Trinity as well. God is a triune God. He, he, he is one God revealed in three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And they are all God. They are all one in power, one in essence, one in will, one in desire. They are one God, one God, but revealed in three persons, and they have different roles. So the Father never died for our sins. The Son did. He exclusively has that role, to die for the sins uh, of sinners and make us righteous. Uh, the Holy Spirit has a very unique role to inspire men to write Scripture. Uh, Jesus did not do that, and the Father did not do that. So you see that in the Trinity, there are very unique roles. And so when we're created in the image of God, male and female, it makes sense that God would create two human beings that are different yet equal in worth and dignity. Uh, and that's exactly what we see. So it would, be, it would be wrong to try to say that man and women are completely equal in all ways. They do have equal worth, they do have equal value, equal dignity, equal access to the blessings of God. But they are, you know, they're different in role in how God designed them. And that absolutely... Uh, resembles who he is as a God, as a triune God. As Sam takes us through Genesis 1, we get the 30,000 foot view of what it means to be a man and a woman. The next morning, he takes us to Genesis 2, lands the plane, and takes us on a ground level tour. But we think it's very important that we go back to Genesis to see what was a part of God's good design uh, pre-fall, before sin even entered in the world. So we can't blame sin or anything like that. We can see, okay, this is how God actually designed a man, actually designed a woman. Uh, in Genesis 1, we see that man and woman, is, they're both created in the image of God. They both have this equal worth, equal value, equal dignity, equal um, access to the blessings in God, and equal access to eternal life in Jesus Christ. But we see uh, in the Trinity that equality doesn't mean sameness in role. So though they can be equal in dignity, worth, value, uh, that does not mean that they're equal in role. Because in the Trinity, there's different roles. The Son died for our sins. The Father did not. So when we go to Genesis 2, we see uh, that we start to see these roles. Because Genesis 2 is a zoom in of the creation of man and woman. So Genesis 1-3 through is, is the creation account, but Genesis 2 is specifically a zoom in on the creation of man. So we're going to look at Genesis 2, and we're going to see what are some of those um, roles that God gave Adam, God gave man. So we're going to just read through it. I'm going to start in verse 4 and read to the end of chapter 2. And it says this, These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created, in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. When no bush of the field was yet in the land, and no small plant of the field had yet sprung up. For the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the land, and there was no man to work the ground. And a mist was going up from the land, and was watering the whole face of the ground. Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living creature. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden, in the east, and there he put the man when, whom he had formed. And out of, the, out of the ground the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A river flowed out of even, Eden to water the garden, and there it divided and became four rivers. The name of the first is Pishon. It is the one that flowed around the whole land of Hillah, where there is gold, and the gold of that land is good. Dulium and Oxstone are there. The name of the second river is Gahon. It is the one that flowed around the whole land of Cush. And the name of the third river is the Tigris, which flows east of Assyria. And the fourth river is Euphrates. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and keep it. So we're going to stop there with verse 15. We see, you know, after God created man from the dust, he planted this garden in Eden. And then he gave Adam the job, the role, to go work the ground. So he, he's called by God to work. I mean, we'll just stop it at there. Leave it at that. He's called to work. And we can see that in Genesis 2 clearly. And then starting in verse 16, 
And the Lord God command, commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. I'm going to stop there now. We see later on in Genesis when God forms Eve that God did not actually command Eve to not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He only commanded Adam to not eat of that tree. So we again can see really kind of implicitly in Genesis 2 that Adam must have taught Eve that commandment. So if we're just looking at Genesis 2, we see it was Adam's role to teach Eve the commandment of God command not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. In, a, in a, another video, Brandon and I will actually hash out what that kind of looks like in our day and age to, uh, you know, to be the teacher of the Word of God, the primary teacher of the Word of God. But nonetheless, we see that Adam taught Eve that commandment in Genesis 2. And so now, starting in verse 19, Now out of the ground the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens. Oh wait, I skipped a verse. Sorry about that. Starting in verse 18. Then the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. So we see that God is saying, you know, out of all these things in creation that are good, you know, God says, This is good, this is good, this is good. Now we see that it's not good that Adam, that man, is alone. I will make, God says, I will make him a helper suitable for him, fit for him. You could say compatible with him. But Adam did not go to God and say, hey, I feel lonely, make me a helper or find me a helper. God says it's not good that Adam is alone. And now God is going to enact this amazing plan to really create in Adam this, this feeling of loneliness. So we'll read on and see what God decides to do. He says, now out of the ground, the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he, should call, what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was, it, was its name. The man gave names to all the livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So this is what God did. You know, he says it's not good that Adam is alone. So what does he do? He brings all these animals, all these birds, all these creatures to Adam to name. It, you know, it it does a practical thing. All these animals get names now, but it also creates in Adam this feeling of loneliness. He's looking at all these creatures, all these animals created by God and realizes that, you know, none of these are actually like me. I don't, I don't share this, this intimacy or this bond or this sameness or likeness with any of these animals. None of these animals bear the image of God like I do as a man. And I'm lonely. I'm the only one like me. I'm the only man who, you know, bears the image of the creator. And, and that's exactly what God wanted to happen. He wanted to create in Adam this feeling of loneliness. And then starting in verse 21, so the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and then while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up his place with flesh. And the rib that the, that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, this is at last, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. So in this amazing, like, almost circle, uh, Eve, woman, is taken out of man, created from man, from his rib, bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh. And then in this amazing thing, in this amazing marriage that God created, one flesh is brought back together. The flesh that Eve is, created from man, is brought back to Adam, and they become one flesh again. So they started as one flesh, they become one flesh again in this this union, this covenant of marriage. And we see at the very end of Genesis 2 where, you know, Moses is writing that a man should leave his father and his mother and be united with his wife and hold fast to his wife. We see another role of man, another role of Adam in Genesis 2, and that is that he is the initiator. So he is the one that pursues his wife the man is the one that leaves his father and his mother and pursues a wife. The wife, the woman, does not leave her father and mother to pursue a man. The man leaves to pursue the wife. And we'll draw that out later on. But just broadly again, broadly again as we look at Genesis 2, again, God does not do anything for just, just randomly. He has a purpose. He has a reason behind everything that he does and everything he created, creates. Everything has an order to it. 
And so when God created man first, we see uh, that that was for a reason. And that would imply headship or leadership. Um, and we see that Eve was created out of man. Man was not created out of woman. Woman was created out of man. Uh, there's a reason for that. There's a very, very specific reason for that. And it's very, very important that we understand that there's a reason for why man was created first and woman was created out of man. But that's just a wrap-up of Genesis 2. Again, we see that there are some very different roles between man and woman in Genesis 2 before the fall, before sin put everything into confusion. In Genesis 1 and 2, Sam walked us through God's design for masculinity and femininity before sin enters the world. In Genesis 3, he'll show us how sin corrupts this good design and it sheds light on our current experience. Now, when we talk about the role of man, when Brandon and I are talking about the role of man, you know, we again go back to Genesis to see how God created Adam or created man in the beginning before sin entered the world. But then the reality is that sin did enter the world and Adam and Eve sinned. And, and then sin puts everything in disarray, confuses everything. And, and there's an enemy that we have, Satan, who tempts us and tries to totally confuse the good order that God created. Um, he wants to flip it upside down. And so if we see um, the order of authority in Genesis before the fall, before sin entered the world, it would go God, man, woman, serpent, or Satan. And then when Satan enters the narrative in Genesis 3, which we're going to look at here in just a minute, we see that he flips it absolutely upside down. He takes the ultimate authority when he starts to tempt, tempt Eve. And so then the authority goes uh, Satan, woman, man, God. And, and we have to realize this. We have to absolutely realize that we have a real enemy, Satan, and the demons, and these spiritual forces that even today are still working to totally invalidate God, uh, to make us think that God lies, to make us think that God's good design and creation is wrong and bad and not good, and, and get us to question the Word of God and get us to question God's generosity and His righteousness and His goodness and His holiness. So we have to realize that. And that's why it is so important to go uh, pre-fall to see, okay, no, this was actually good before the fall. And that would mean it would be still good for us to act that way today. But we're going to read the fall, the, the fall account in Genesis 3. And we see that, you know, one, Satan understands this divine order. And so if he wants to totally go against that, he's going to switch it. So we can kind of like... Uh, reverse engineer that to see, okay, no, this is the right order if Satan's doing the wrong order, if that makes sense. Hopefully you understand that. But we also see that God delivers some consequences for the sin of man, the sin of woman, and the sin of, of Satan. And we can also kind of reverse engineer those consequences to again see what the role is because the role, the consequent has to do with the role. So we're just going to read through Genesis 3 and draw some of those things out. So starting verse 1, Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, we can stop there. Again, Satan went to the woman. The authority structure is already being changed. Did God actually say, You shall not eat of the tree of the knowledge, or you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. God did not say that you couldn't touch it. So here we go. God gave Adam the commandment. Adam taught Eve the commandment. So either Adam screwed up in his teaching, um, or he did not screw up in his teaching, which he probably did not. But here's the problem. It was we could probably imply or we could see implicitly here that it was Adam's role not only to teach the commandment to Eve but to defend it as well when somebody comes to try to say, did God really say this? And so we'll keep reading. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate and she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. So Adam was with Eve the whole time. Now, Adam, knowing the command that God had given him in Genesis 2, should have actively stepped in in between Eve and Satan and said, no, 
that's actually not right. This is the command that God gave us. You're lying, Satan. That's not right. But he didn't. He sat there passively beside and said nothing and let Satan tempt Eve. You could almost say that that was sin right there before the even of the of the tree. So we'll continue. Starting in verse 9, we see, She took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And then they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord and God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to man and said to him, Where are you? We saw in Genesis 2 that God created man first, and then he created woman out of man. And that implies uh, headship or leadership. And so with headship or leadership also means responsibility and accountability. Uh, if you, you know, you can even think of just like today, if you are an employer and you work for an employer or employee and you work for an employer and you have a boss, the boss is actually really accountable for all of his employees or all of her employees. I mean, they have that responsibility and that accountability. And you can even think of like, like a coach, you know, coach is, is, is coaching, uh, you know, let's say a high school sports team. The coach is accountable for all their athletes. When they're out on a trip, you could say traveling. That coach is responsible and accountable for the well-being of all the athletes, all the student athletes. And the parents, if their the son or daughter got hurt on this trip, they would go to the coach and say, what are you doing? I put my son or daughter in, you know, with you and you were accountable for their safety. And so we see just everywhere in our society that anytime somebody has leadership or authority, it also means accountability and responsibility. And God understood that because that's how God created it. So when Eve ate of the tree and when she gave some fruit to Adam to eat of the tree and they sinned, when God came into the garden to confront them, he called out Adam's name. He called for the man because he was accountable. So now we're going to see as we start to read on that God is going to deliver some consequences. He said, where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked. I hid myself. He said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I command you not to eat? The man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit of the tree and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? The woman said, the serpent to see me and I ate. So now we see that in their sinful state, uh, they play the blame game. Adam blames God and Eve. And Eve blames Satan. And so in their sin now, neither of them take responsibility for their sin. Adam does not take responsibility for his sin, nor the sin of his wife. He blames it on his wife and on God, which is obviously just crazy that he would do that. But now sin has entered the world. And so now we see... The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all the beasts of the field, and on your belly you shall go, and the dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. To the woman. So here's the consequences to the woman. I will surely multiply your pain and childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, but he shall rule over you. Uh, I just want to quickly say something brief about that part. Part Your desire shall be for your husband, but he shall rule over you. And one chapter later in Genesis 4-7, we see that the same word desire is used as it's pertaining to sin. Sin desires to have you, but you must rule over it. So we see that this desire that sin has to have us is a wrong desire. It's not a good desire. It's, it's sin. It's exactly what that is. Sin desires to have you, desires to corrupt you, rule over you, totally put you into confusion and disarray. And this, this Hebrew word desire is the same word used here in Genesis 3 when, when Moses is writing, your desire shall be for your husband, but he shall rule over you. So we kind of see that again in the consequences. We can reverse engineer this. Oh, the woman should not rule over the husband. He shall rule over you. And then he says to Adam, and to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife, 
and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you, in pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Now we see again that the consequence for Adam was increased pain and work in the land. You know, he's going to work in thistles and, and all this stuff that, and weeds, and he's going to sweat. And it's going to be hard, hard, hard work. And so if man's role, as we saw in Genesis 2, was to work the garden, and that was good, now God is going to put the consequence of making that work hard. And almost, you could say, try to make us not want to work or be passive in that work. But we have to still work because that's how God designed us as men to work. And then we'll finish up Genesis 2. Or Genesis 3, the man called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. Here's another uh, place where we see that man has headship or leadership uh, because he names Eve. And the Lord God made for Adam and his wife garments and skins and clothed them. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. Now lest he reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him out from the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man... And at the east of the Garden of Eden, he placed a cherubim and a flaming sword that turned away every, every way to guard the way to the tree of life. So that's the end of the fall account in Genesis 3. And that kind of encompasses uh, Genesis 1 through 3.